Okay, in our video series of rheumatology lectures, in this video, we are going to talk about gout. A 32-year-old man comes to your clinic and tells you that doctor, last night he was at a barbecue party where he enjoyed meat a lot. At 11 p.m., he went to bed for sleep. At 2 a.m., at the dead of the night, he woke up with severe excruciating pain in the right big toe. He never experienced such pain before. He's, he was totally okay before that. That pain was sudden onset severe pain in the right big toe right after a heavy meal containing meat. This is a classical presentation of gout. What is gout? What is the clinical presentation? What is the treatment and management? Today we'll discuss that in detail. Gout is an inflammatory crystal arthropathy caused by precipitation and deposition of uric acid crystal. Gout is basically caused by excessive uric acid in the blood that excess uric acid gets deposited in the joints and it forms crystals. When these crystals are present in the joint, they, these crystals cause inflammation and that inflammation results in pain, severe excruciating pain. That's why it causes inflammation due to the crystal arthropathy, crystal deposition, deposition of uric acid crystals that is called as gout. It is more common in males as compared to females. There are two peaks of the disease in 30 to 39 years of age it is more common. Therefore, the case that we had was of 32 years old and at 60 years of age. Now coming to the etiology of gout. In etiology of gout, either it will be primary hyperuricemia or it will be secondary hyperuricemia. In primary hyperuricemia, there will be increased production of uric acid or decreased excretion of uric acid from the body, but that is idiopathic. We do not know what is causing increased production and what is causing decreased excretion from the body. That is called as primary hyperuricemia where it is idiopathic. And it is aggravated by dietary habits, dietary habits like taking excess red meat, consuming seafood that can aggravate hyperuricemia. In secondary hyperuricemia, it also has the same thing, decreased excretion, increased production, but now we know the cause. In secondary hyperuricemia, we know what is causing increased production and what is causing decreased excretion. In increased production, causes include tumor lysis syndrome. The classical scenario would be that the patient was started on chemotherapy for the treatment of certain tumor and after the, uh, the chemotherapy, patients develop severe pain in the joint. That is due to hyperuricemia because this uric acid is produced from the purines. The purines are present in the DNA, in the nucleotides. These purines form the nucleotide and nucleotide form the DNA. So whenever there is destruction of the cells, whenever there is destruction of the DNA, the destruction of DNA produces uric acid. So anything that destroys the cells of the body will result in excess uric acid production. Tumor lysis in which there is damage, destruction of the cells of tumor causes increased production of uric acid. Hemolytic anemias in which there is lysis of red blood cells. Now you'll be thinking that the red blood cells do not contain nucleus, they do not contain DNA. Then how is that causing hyperuricemia? Basically, the mature RBCs uh, destruction do not cause hyperuricemia it's the destruction of the primitive rbcs the the premature rbcs the baby rbcs that those baby rbcs contain nucleus later on as they mature they lose the nucleus but the primitive rbcs the reticulocytes they contain nucleus and if they are destroyed they will lead to hyperuricemia leish nehan syndrome leish nehan syndrome is an, an a syndrome in which there is deficiency of a certain enzyme in the pathway of uric acid production and if that enzyme is deficient it leads to overproduction of uric acid so there is overproduction of uric acid in leish nehan syndrome purine rich diets consumption like red meat seafoods and calcium poor diet remember calcium poor diets lead to hyperuricemia so in the treatment we will ask the patient to take more dairy products to treat hyperuricemia. Obesity, we ask the patient to lose weight to treat hyperuricemia. 
so these are the causes of increased production of uric acid now coming to decreased excretion decreased excretion is the most common cause of secondary hyperuricemia and in this you must memorize the medications that cause decreased excretion it is a commonly tested point in exams that they ask you about the medications that cause decreased excretion of uric acid these medications include pyrazinamide, aspirin, loop diuretics, thiazide diuretic, niacin. A classical scenario in, in the exams that you would see is that a patient was started on uh, an antihypertensive drug and that patient developed gout. That patient developed severe pain in the joint. What medication was started? That is thiazide. Thiazide diuretic is a very important diuretic that causes hyperuricemia and can precipitate an episode of gout. Chronic renal insufficiency, ketoacidosis, and postmenopause. These are the risk factor of decreased excretion. Now, postmenopause. How postmenopause uh, can cause decreased excretion? Basically, estrogen causes excretion of uric acid in urine. So, whenever there is decreased estrogen, as in postmenopausal state there will be decreased excretion of uric acid combined decreased excretion and overproduction now what are the causes in which there is overproduction as well as decreased excretion that results in build up of uric acid and blood the most important cause and the most common cause is alcohol alcohol contains a high level of purines in it and as i said purines are degraded to uric acid when the purines are degraded they produce uric acid so alcohol contains high level of purines and they can lead to hyperuricemia as well as alcohol also causes decreased uric acid excretion from the kidneys so it decreases uric acid excretion from the kidneys and increases production of uric acid in the blood so there will be hyperuricemia and one of the classical presentation is that at the barbecue nights usually people take barbecue with alcohol so both of the risk factors are there that can result in gout at night now coming to the clinical presentation of the gout now remember there can be two presentation a chronic gout state in which there is chronic damage to the joint and in within that patient develops acute gout flares acute exacerbations of the gout patient can have an asymptomatic stage it may last for greater than 10 years and patient is slowly getting developing hyperuricemia in blood that will precipitate into a gout attack so patient might have an asymptomatic stage that can precipitate into an acute gout flare after a barbecue night where he had a lot of red meat and with that he took alcohol that will result in severe gout attack at night now coming to acute gouty arthritis acute gouty arthritis is now the flare that patient has developed the severe exacerbation that patient has developed in that severe exacerbation patient will have acute severe pain in the joint erythema decreased range of motion swelling and warmth now if you notice at this you will realize one other thing also has the very same presentation and that is septic arthritis in septic arthritis there is acute severe pain with erythema decreased range of motion swelling and warmth same exact presentation but the differentiating factor is that if it is totally sudden onset if the patient was totally fine and all of a sudden within within few hours patient developed this condition severe pain that is a gout and if the patient develops severe pain over days initially the pain was low but then the patient's pain increased and patient developed this condition in slow manner within days that is septic arthritis so if it is sudden onset it is gout if it is slow onset over days it is septic arthritis and we will differentiate it on synovial fluid analysis acute gouty arthritis occurs at night and it wakes the patient up from sleep pain peaks in 12 to 24 hours and it regresses over days to weeks the triggers the classical triggers purine rich meal seafoods calcium low diets red meat alcohol consumption even trauma surgery in trauma there is damage to the cells that rhabdomyolysis can cause hyperuricemia surgery diuresis in which if you have started diuretic like thiazide diuretic that causes hyperuricemia it can cause hyperuricemia dehydration where there is over concentration of uric acid so these all these are all the triggers that can precipitate an acute gouty attack 
and the classical joint that is involved first is podagra mtp joint metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe of foot it occurs at the night and it wakes the patient up and it is severely painful most common site is podagra this is the metatarsophalangeal joint that is involved in podagra gunagra it is the inflammation of the knee chiragra so these are some weird names that you have to remember if you just remember the concept if you have the concept that what is happening with the joints the most important joint is the mtp joint of the big toe that is called as podagra chiragra inflammation of the finger mtp metatarsophalangeal joint this joint of the thumb and disquamation of the overlying skin may occur in the recovery phase now coming to chronic gout now as i said that the patient will be asymptomatic for many years and then suddenly the patient goes to a barbecue party where he consumes lots of meat and alcohol and suddenly he develops an acute gout flare and then he reaches to out to the doctor where he gets the treatment if the treatment is started that patient will be well that patient will have a controlled gout but if the patient does not take the treatment or if the patient discontinues the medication and patient does not take the chronic treatment that patient will now develop chronic gout and it takes several years to develop and it is now rare due to the more development in the treatments but it is commonly seen in the patients who do not receive treatments as the patients from far flung villages these poor patients do not receive treatments of the gout flares and then these patients have chronic gout for several years and there is deposition of uric acid crystals in these joints for years and these patients develop tophi tophi are basically uh, excessive accumulation of crystals in the joint there can be bone tophi there can be soft tissue tophi and in the renal involvement they will develop nephrolithiasis stones in the kidney uric acid stones nephropathy due after these stones have developed it will result in damage to the kidneys nephropathy this is a picture showing the tophi look at the accumulation of uric acid and destruction of the joints that occurs in chronic gout patients who do not receive treatment this is another picture showing soft tissue tophi in the ear this is a picture showing bone tophi in the elbow look at the accumulation of uric acid and this occurs in the patients who are not getting treatment now coming to the diagnosis of gout now remember as i said that gout has a very similar picture to septic arthritis and we need to differentiate septic arthritis from gout so the first and the foremost test that you have to do and the gold standard test for the diagnosis of gout is synovial fluid analysis that will help you differentiate that whether it is septic arthritis or it is gout you take this a synovial fluid sample from the joint and you send it for polarized light microscopy you send another sample for cell count and you send the third sample for gram staining and culture so under the polarized light microscopy you will get the diagnosis of gout because you will see crystals in polarized light microscopy basically you do microscopy in which you see the crystals then you give a light to the crystals and under that light you see the color of the crystals that is called as polarized light microscopy needle shaped monosodium urate crystals that are negatively bile fringent now i'll explain what does it mean when you take the sample and put it under the slide and you look it under the microscope you will see needle shaped crystals like these and when you give a light polarized light to it these crystals will glow up this is the direction of the polarized light a polarized light is passed through the sample and these crystals will appear yellow when they are lying parallel to the light so that is a negatively biofringent yellow colored crystal needle shaped crystals that is diagnostic for gout in the cell count what you will see is that wbc count will be greater than 2000 but it will not be more than 50000 if it is more than 50000 then it is diagnostic of septic arthritis but since it is not a episode of septic arthritis there is no infection in the uh, uh, joint there is just the deposition of crystals in the joint so the wbc count will be greater than 2000 but it will not be uh, uh, 50, above 50000 on the gram stain and cultures there will be no bacteria because it is not a septic arthritis it is gouty arthritis 
Now coming to serum uric acid levels. Now in, I have seen many doctors who have the trend of sending serum uric acid levels in the acute gouty flare. There is no use of serum uric acid levels in acute gouty flare. Even if they are high, they are not diagnostic of uh, acute gouty flare. Because serum uric acid levels can even be normal, they can even be low in acute gouty flare. So they have no use in acute gout flare. There is no use of serum uric acid levels. But for patient on a chronic gout therapy, a patient who is given medication to control the chronic gout, in such patients you can use serum, serum uric acid level to guide the therapy. But in acute gout flare, for the diagnosis of acute gout flare, there is, this test is useless because it can be normal, it can be even low. So you cannot use serum uric acid level for the diagnosis of acute gout flare. If in some case you do synovial fluid analysis and you fail to take out any fluid from the joint or if the patient refuses to uh, give you the permission to take the fluid from the joint, in that case you can use imaging. Remember synovial fluid analysis is the gold standard. But in any case if you fail to take out the fluid or if the patient does not allow you, in that case you can go for imaging. In imaging if it is acute gout, in acute gout if it is the first episode there will be no findings on x-ray but if it is a recurrent if the patient is having recurrent gout and there are multiple episodes of uh, a gouty flare in chronic gout you will see findings on x-ray but remember imaging has low use in the diagnosis of acute gout flare because the first episodes in first episodes of acute gouty arthritis the, there is no significant damage to the joints that is visible on the x-rays Synovial fluid analysis is the gold standard, but you can help the diagnosis in, in patients with chronic gout. What you will see is that you will see punched out lytic bone lesions that are called as rat bite lesions that is due to destruction of the bones. And remember on imaging you can never rule out septic arthritis. The only way to rule out septic arthritis is you take out the sample and send for culture and cytology. This is a picture showing a rat bite lesion just as if a rat has bit the bone and taken a piece of bone away. So that is a rat bite lesion. Look and over here there is another uh, bite, rat bite lesion. This is a picture showing rat bite lesion, rat bite lesions in the joints. This is the picture showing destruction of MTP joint, metatarsophalangeal joint in patients with gout. Important point in acute gout flare, serum uric acid levels have no use. They can be even elevated, they can be normal, they can be low. A very high yield point to remember. Now, coming to the treatment of acute gouty flare. In the acute gouty flare, there are certain general measures that you need to advise to the patient. You limit the alcohol consumption, you limit the intake of purines, red meat, shellfish, seafoods, and you limit the intake of high fructose corn syrup things. The many processed foods, the many sugary drinks that are present in the market and in the stores, they have high content of fructose in it. And that high content of fructose contain high level of purines that result in hyperuricemia. Sugary foods, juices, non-diet sodas. And if the patient is obese, you ask the patient to lose weight. So these are the general measures that you ask the patient to have. In the general measures, you also look at the medications, at what medications that patient is taking and in the medications, if you find thiazide diuretic, change the thiazide to an ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Losartan is a preferred drug. In acute gout flare, there is severe pain in the joint. You ask the patient to rest and ice the affected joint. And in the medications, the first line medications include NSAIDs, glucocorticoids and colchicine. Now these are the medications that reduce the acute inflammation. They reduce the acute inflammation and the most important drug is glucocorticoid. American College of Physician guidelines recommend the use of glucocorticoids in patient in acute gout flares. Colchicine is mainly used in the patients who cannot receive the above two drugs. These are the patients who have the complaint of peptic ulcer disease. In such patients, NSAIDs and glucocorticoids cannot be used. In such case, you will go for colchicine. But among these, preferred drug is glucocorticoids. Second line drug include IL-1 inhibitors or ACTH. Basically, ACTH stimulates the production of cortisol steroids that you can give orally. IL-1 inhibitors are basically the drugs that reduce IL-1 and reduce inflammatory mediators. 
or you can even use combination therapy a combination of these drugs combination therapies include glucocorticoids with colchicine and sids with colchicines intra articular glucocorticoids which are rarely used with NSAIDs. remember you cannot use oral glucocorticoids with NSAIDs because both of these drugs cause GI distress and they increase the risk of ulcers. Even if in any case you have to give these drugs, glucocorticoids and oral NSAIDs together, always prescribe a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor with them. And if the patient is having peptic ulcer disease, you should go for colchicine straight away. Do not use glucocorticoids or NSAIDs. Now coming to systemic glucocorticoids, as I said among the first three, systemic glucocorticoids are the preferred drugs for acute gout flare. They can be oral prednisone 0.5 mg per kg once daily or oral prednisolone can be used 0.5 mg per kg once daily for 5 days or until the resolution of acute gout flare these glucocorticoids can be given. In systemic glucocorticoids, if you want to give intramuscular or IV steroids, you can give IV methyl prednisolone 0.5 to 2 mg per kg once daily repeated as needed or intra-articular steroids. In NSAIDs, in the first line drugs, NSAIDs are also there that include naproxen 750 mg per orally once then 250 mg per orally 8 hourly or selective COX-2 inhibitors like selicoxib can be used. So these are the NSAIDs that can be used. An important point to remember is that aspirin is an NSAID but we do not use aspirin. I did not mention aspirin in the treatment of acute gout flare. Remember, I mentioned aspirin as a cause of hyperuricemia in the causes. I mentioned aspirin causes hyperuricemia. Aspirin is an NSAID but it cannot be used for the treatment of acute gout flare because it causes hyperuricemia. It can trigger gout flare. But what if the patient is already taking aspirin and that patient uh, develops acute gout flare. If a person is taking aspirin, low dose aspirin for stroke or coronary artery disease and that patient develops acute gouty flare, you should not discontinue aspirin in that case. Colchicine is used in patients with GI ulcers. Patients who cannot take NSAIDs, patients who cannot take oral glucocorticoids must be given colchicine. It is given within 12 hours for the most benefit 1.2 mg per orally once then 0.6 mg per orally one hour later. The most common adverse effect is diarrhea and it is contraindicated in CKD patients. So that was the management of acute gout. The acute gout flare that that patient had. Now coming to the management of chronic gout. In the management of chronic gout, you give certain drugs that lower the uric acid level and keep the uric acid level to the baseline. And in these patients, serum uric acid levels can guide the therapy. In acute gout flare, serum uric acid levels have no use. But in chronic gout treatment, you can uh, uh, take the serum uric acid levels to guide the therapy. Chronic gout is treated with urate lowering therapy drugs. The first line drugs include xanthine oxidase inhibitors that include allopurinol, the most important drug. Allopurinol decreases the uric acid production. It is a first line drug. Second line drugs include uricose uric drugs like probenicid. This probenicid basically causes elimination of uric acid in urine and it decreases the uric acid levels. Third line drugs include recombinant uricase drugs like Peglotikase. Peglotikase converts uric acid to allantoin and causes excretion from the body. So these are the drugs that are used in chronic gout and they lower the urate level and maintain the urate level at a certain baseline. Now remember, if a patient comes to your clinic and that patient is diagnosed with an acute gout flare and that patient was not taking any urate lowering therapy, in that patient you only give the acute gout flare treatment. You give the glucocorticoids or you give the NSAIDs, you give the colchicine. Never start urate lowering therapy in a patient with acute gout flare. Because this urate lowering therapy, actually it causes the removal of uric acid from the body. And when there is an acute gout flare in the patient and there is there are crystals present in the joints, this urate lowering therapy will dig out those crystals and throw it out from the body. But in that process, this urate lowering therapy can take out these crystals and put it in some other joints of the body. 
सो इफ द पेशेंट इज हैविंग एक्यूट गाउट फ्लेयर दिस यूरेट लोअरिंग थेरेपी कैन फर्दर एक्सरबेट द एक्यूट गाउट फ्लेयर बिकॉज इट विल टेक द क्रिस्टल्स फ्रॉम वन प्लेस एंड इट कैन डिपोजिट द क्रिस्टल्स इन टू द अदर ज्वाइंट एंड इट विल फर्दर एक्सरबेट द एक्यूट गाउट फ्लेयर सो रिमेंबर never give you rate lowering therapy during an acute flare because it worsens the acute flare it will shift it will shift the crystals from one joint to another joint and it will worsen the acute flare so it is contraindicated in acute flare when the acute flare has passed and patient is now stable after that you can start the urate lowering therapy you never start the urate lowering therapy if the patient is having acute flare and now if the patient had the flare and now you decide to start the urate lowering therapy you start aloperinol or you start the probenecid now prophylactically it is recommended that for a week you give nsaids or steroids for some time so that patient does not develop a flare because as i said that this urate lowering therapy drugs they will take out the crystal and they will throw it out from the body but in that process there are, there is a chance that there will be hyperuricemia in the blood and that hyperuricemia will further deposit uh, the crystal in the other joints and result in exacerbation and uh, gout episodes so prophylactically it is recommended that you give nsaids steroids or colchicine for some time and then you start the patient on urate lowering therapy indications to the urate lowering therapy include damage to the joints due to chronic gout on imaging to fire development frequent gout attack greater than 2 per year and the titration target is that you bring the uric acid levels to less than 6 mg per deciliter with lifestyle modifications and drugs now this is a checklist that you can use in hospital to go in a sequence uh, to manage a patient with acute gout flare in acute gout flare the first thing that you should consider limb threatening differential diagnosis like septic arthritis because it also has the same presentation and then you should go for diagnostic arthrocentesis labs or imaging if needed the main thing is arthrocentesis you consult the rheumatology department if the diagnosis remains uncertain you give the adequate analgesia with nsaids glucocorticoids you rest the joint and you use the ice therapy now what if the patient is already taking a urate lowering therapy and that patient develops an acute gout flare if the patient is already taking a urate lowering therapy that urate lowering therapy does not need to be discontinued but if the patient is not taking urate lowering therapy and that patient has an acute gout flare never start accurate lowering therapy at that point if the patient is already taking it it should not be discontinued initiate pharmacotherapy for acute gout as early as possible uh, you can use glucocorticoids nsaids or colchicine the preferred one is glucocorticoids consider indication for combination therapy and follow up the patient with primary care provider or rheumatologist Before going into the summary if you liked my video please click on the subscribe button we talked about what is gout we talked about the causes of gout primary and secondary causes decreased production increased production combined overproduction and under excretion of uric acid the clinical presentation of acute gouty arthritis the triggers and the presentation of chronic gout the diagnosis with synovial fluid analysis and the serum uric acid has no use in acute gout flare and it is used to guide therapy in chronic gout patients synovial fluid if fails you can go for imaging in chronic gout patients treatment the general myers acute gout flare first line drugs second line drugs systemic glucocorticoids and their doses nsaids that can be used in acute gout flare the treatment of chronic gout first line second line third line never give never start urate lowering therapy in acute gout flare and if you are about to start urate lowering therapy give low dose anti inflammatory drugs for some time indications of urate lowering therapy if you liked my video please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on rheumatology lectures the link of those videos is given in the description below thank you very much